Hey, good morning, Grace Point. I'm Pastor Justin. I just wanted to invite you to worship with us this morning. Uh, this morning we will have a couple of songs uh, led by Phil Whining, and then we will have a message uh, brought by Pastor Andrew. Uh, so wherever you may be, uh, whether it's your, you know, in your home or in your car or somewhere else, uh, we're just glad that you can join us. So we invite you to sing um, and to listen to the Word of God together this morning. Thanks, Justin. For worship this morning, I'd like to start with the song, 10,000 Reasons. I think it's an appropriate song uh, for the time we're in right now. You know, when things are a little stressful, I'm sure a lot of you are uh, going through stress and, and it's easy for anxiety and worry to creep in. Um, one, of the things that, one thing that can help us get some perspective is to counter blessings, to consider the ways in which God is currently blessing us, and then also to remember the ways in which he's been faithful in the past. And uh, this song is kind of a great reminder of the goodness of God, and if we think about uh, and take the time to consider, um, I think we'll find some ways that God is blessing us right now. So let's affirm his goodness together by singing this song, 10,000 Reasons. <laughs>
Next song we're going to sing is the song Never Once, another great song that reminds us of God's goodness and his faithfulness both today and in times that he's been faithful in the past. Let's sing together. Just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but we join our hearts in saying, Yes, our hearts can sing. Thank you so much, Phil, for leading us in worship together. Uh, good morning, Pastor Andrew. I'm so excited to be joining you this morning to talk about the triumphal entry. We often call this Palm Sunday, and we describe that because of a passage that we're going to look at in John chapter 12. The passage this morning in John chapter 12 starts in verse 12, and it says that the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. This is a, a setting that Jesus is now riding in to the capital city of Israel. He's riding in, he's, he's entered the city many times before. He's gone to the temple, he's taught there. But a lot of his ministry happened north of the capital city, outside of the hub of all the hustle and the bustle and the religious festivities. And he is now coming into Jerusalem 
not just as a teacher, not just as a inspiration, not just as a novel figure, but as he's writing in, it says that the crowd, they took branches and they took branches of palm trees and they're laying it to prepare the path for the king. And it says that they went to meet him and they cried Hosanna. This idea of Hosanna means save now. That they're they're asking Jesus who's coming in to the, the city of Jerusalem to save them now. And it says that he's blessed because he's coming in the name of the Lord. And they describe him as the king of Israel. Now imagine riding into a, a foreign country and being honored as the king there just arriving. And to a lot of political leaders, this would have seemed crazy. Here's someone who's coming who's a peasant from uh, the region of Galilee. And he's riding in to Jerusalem. And he's being honored as the king of Israel. It says that Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it. Just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, city, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is uh, Jesus fulfilling this prophecy. It said that he rode into Jerusalem. Normally, when a king rode back into a capital city, he'd be riding on a fine horse, maybe in a chariot, uh, a status symbol, something of honor and worth. And yet Jesus chooses to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And this would be kind of be riding into the capital city on a 96 Honda Civic. Not bad, but also not the limousine that you expect. And Jesus here is doing this so that as he's riding into the city, the people will see him. They'll see the honor that the king receives. They'll see him coming in on a donkey. And that this should ring in their minds a prophecy that was given so many years ago that the king of Israel would ride in on a donkey's colt. His disciples says, did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, so this is saying after Jesus' death and then his resurrection, when he was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Now this is drawing an allusion to a story that had happened just beforehand. See, Jesus had a friend, and his name was Lazarus. Lazarus had gotten very sick, even to the point of death. And um, he, Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha, were friends of Jesus. And so they sent a word for Jesus to come and heal Lazarus, because they had seen Jesus heal so many other people. And certainly if he had healed all these other people, why wouldn't he want to heal his good friend Lazarus? But the story tells us that Jesus had deliberately waited. He had, he had waited until Lazarus had actually died. And then at that point, decides to go see his friend. He arrives at the tomb there and he sees uh, Mary and then he sees Martha and they're both just overwhelmed with grief. And they're struggling with the fact that Jesus, they knew if Jesus had just been there, if, if he showed up on time, that their brother would have been alive. And yet Jesus had delayed and he had waited and death had claimed their brother. And Jesus had promised, he says, don't weep, Lazarus is just sleeping. And he brings Lazarus back from the dead. Now, now this poses a huge problem. Because if you can bring someone back from the dead, everything else you claim is true. See, Jesus had staked his whole life and his ministry on the ability to rise from the dead. Now, there's people that can heal. There's doctors and nurses that do a wonderful job of that. There's people that can teach well. There's people that um, can communicate. There's people that are inspirational. But Jesus didn't base his claims on any of these. He based his claim on that he was, he was God and that he would prove that by conquering death. See, death is an enemy that none of us in our human state have the ability to conquer. We can try pushing it off. We can try deferring it. We can try keeping the effects of that decay at bay. But death eventually will claim us all. And so what Jesus claimed coming in uh, was that you would know that he was the son of God because he died and he rose from the dead. Well, when it came to Lazarus, this was in a town of Bethany, a little bit outside of Jerusalem. This would have been 
a huge problem for the religious leaders trying to discredit Jesus. Because here was someone that was dead and someone that was buried and that was sealed in a tomb. And then multiple days later, Jesus brings him back from the dead. In fact, he'd been dead and in the tomb so long that his sister said, ah, don't disturb him. He's, his body's beginning to decay and rot. And yet Jesus is perfect. This is a great time for a resurrection. Well, we see this crowd has come and they're following Jesus around still. It says that they're following Jesus and it says that they were, they continued to bear witness. So this crowd is part of the crowd that's in Jerusalem on that day. And when they see Jesus coming, they no longer see just a great teacher. They don't, no longer see an inspirational leader. They no longer see someone who's able to feed them and, and, and meet their physical needs. What they're seeing is that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem as the king, not just over a municipality or a region or an empire, but they're seeing a king who has conquered death. There's no king in the history of the universe that has been able to do that. And yet Jesus rides into Jerusalem as the conqueror of death. Well, when we're looking for people to have authority over us or a rule over us, we like to think that they have our best interest in mind. And certainly, even as a nation, we're in a time right now that, man, we wish our leaders had the ability just to wave a magic wand and end the infection. That they could just do everything right and heal people. And, but Jesus is being honored as the ruler who did that. That he is the ultimate king over the ultimate enemy, and that's death. It says that the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. Wouldn't you go to go see a guy who raised someone from the dead? I mean, all the mourners were there. They had the whole funeral going on. And in the midst of the funeral, Jesus says, we're stopping the funeral, and we're going to turn this into a resurrection party. And everybody hears, and they say, I want to see Jesus. I want to see the king who has power over death. And so when Jesus walks into Jerusalem, the word had spread throughout the town. I don't know if they tweeted it or Facebook or, you know, notification on their phone. But somehow they heard that Jesus, the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, was coming into town. So the Pharisees, this is the group that had opposed Jesus and, and refused to submit to his leadership. They said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. In fact, this same group was so bothered by the resurrection of Lazarus that they wanted to put, in other passages, we're told that they wanted to put Lazarus to sleep again. They wanted to kill him. I mean, how, how twisted is that? This group is so opposed to Jesus that they're willing to kill the one witness who had just come back from the dead. I mean, killing somebody once is bad, but killing them again seems twice as bad. And yet they understood what sometimes we fail to understand is that the crowds that were there were not honoring Jesus as just a good teacher. They were not honoring Jesus as someone who made them feel loved and welcomed. They were not just honoring one as who took care of their physical needs. They were honoring a king. They were honoring a king who is coming into his capital city. I think a lot of times we think about Jesus and we think about him as Jesus being meek and mild and, and Jesus wouldn't harm a, uh, an animal or, or Jesus is, is tender and compassionate with the children. And all of those things are true. But we also see this other side of Jesus. There's that he is undisputed king. Over a realm that no other king before or since has been able to conquer. And that's the realm of death. That Jesus comes and when he says that he can give eternal life, it's because he controls life and death and eternity. He's entering Jerusalem as the most powerful king that Jerusalem or the world will ever see. And he had showed that in a small way with the resurrection of Lazarus, if you can call a resurrection from the dead being small. 
but he'll ultimately demonstrate it by rising himself from the dead a week later. Jesus is coming in as the king over life and death. Yes, as described, he is the king of Jerusalem, the king of Israel, but he's much more than just the king of Israel. He's riding into Jerusalem as the king of eternity. Today, we all have the choice that is presented here to these people. These people had, had a couple choices. They, they heard Jesus was coming and some ran to be a part of the worship. They said, this is incredible. We have an opportunity to honor and worship a king that conquers death. We're not going to miss this. That we're going to set aside all the distractions, all the other things to do today. That we're going to worship the king. And we're going to submit to the ultimate king. The other choice is that the Pharisees, that they showed up too. They're observing everything that's going on. They, they see Jesus. They understand his claims. They understand his power. And their response was, how do we kill him quicker? How do we end this? Because everybody's going after him. And I think there's a third response. There's, there's people here that didn't show up to worship. There's people that also didn't show up to oppose. They just didn't show up. They, maybe they were distracted that day. Maybe they were busy that day. Maybe they were, they were tired that day. Maybe they had other things going on in their life. And so they said, ah, we can see the king some other day. Or we can figure out who Jesus is some other day. There's a lot of tragedy in our nation right now. But I think one of the things that we can take and value is that we have the opportunity to understand how fragile and how precious life truly is. That none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. That life comes quickly and it, and it goes quickly. And in the midst of this, that there's something in our hearts that always wants to defeat death. That we don't want to succumb to that. That we don't want to be um, uh, crippled by that. And yet that we know that on our timetable, that's written. But in the midst of this, we are presented today with a king who has conquered death. We see that Jesus, as he came and he lived a perfect life, he suffered and he died and then he rose again from the grave, that he truly is king over eternity. And that we're all given a similar choice to what's being presented here in John chapter 12. That we have the choice to worship you and I, we can jump into that party. We can jump into that celebration. We can say no to ourselves and we can say yes to Jesus. We can, we can turn from our sin that's held us in bondage for so long and we can turn to Jesus for forgiveness and cleansing and eternal life. Because that we're told that knowing Jesus is life eternal. And that we have that option this morning. And maybe today you're scared. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're overwhelmed. You have the opportunity this morning, right there in your living room, in your car, to turn to Jesus, to acknowledge him as your savior, to repent, to turn from your sin, and that you can place your life in the hands of a king who controls eternity. You also have the option that the Pharisees had. You can look at everything going around and you can be so upset and so angry. You can feel like that Jesus is a threat. That, that he hasn't done exactly the things that you wish he would. And so as a result, you're going to oppose Jesus. And you have that option. But just like the Pharisees expressed, they said, that, they said to one another that you will see that you are gaining nothing. That the world will go after him. There's also the third option is that we're just too busy. We have too many things going on. We're going to we're going to put this decision off to a day that we have more luxury where life is a little bit calmer and we can be really deliberate about this. But by doing so, we risk missing out. 
Because as we all know, we have those things on our to-do list that say, someday I'm going to get to that. Someday I'm going to get to that. Someday I'm going to get to that. And even with a lot more time on our hands right now, we're still not finding that that is that someday. Because we can procrastinate indefinitely. But the danger is, although we're not opposing, we're not pushing Jesus away, we're not saying no to Jesus, we still are not saying yes. And by by not bowing the knee, by not submitting joyfully to the rule of Jesus, we're in effect saying no. It would kind of be like, you, you know, start dating somebody and you think, man, it'd be awesome to spend the rest of my life together with them. Yeah, we should get married someday. And so someday I'm going to ask them. But that someday never comes. And if that someday never comes where you ask them, and that someday never comes where they ask you, then you're never going to be married someday. Because you have to take action. I would encourage you this morning, as you're watching this, as you're reflecting on this, that we will give our life serving someone or something. We have plenty of options. We can serve our family. We can serve uh, work. We can serve money. We can serve entertainment. But if we're going to spend our life serving someone, shouldn't we make it? We should make sure that we spend our life serving someone who is worthy. Who could be more worthy than the king who defeats death? Who could be more worthy than the king who holds the power of life and death? I would encourage you this morning, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, if you've never acknowledged his rule in your life, if you've never repented and turned from your sins, I would encourage you to do that this morning, right where you are. Yes, you're not in a fancy church building. You're not in the, the perfectly spiritual moment. But Jesus is happy when we turn to him. Maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a while, but you've been more even into his teachings or, or you like his inspiration. But he's more than just a good teacher. We need to acknowledge him. As the great eternal king. Let's pray together. Our God, we are grateful for you this morning. We thank you that you're not just a leader. You're not just a teacher. You're not just an inspiration. But that you came to earth as a king. A king to rule over all. We ask this morning that if there's those who have not bowed their knee to you as king, that they would do so right in their living room. That you would allow us to submit to your rule and submit to it joyfully. We thank you that you have conquered death. That as we look at our own mortality, our own uh, frailty, that we can acknowledge that we serve a king who is greater than death itself. Allow us to worship you as you deserve this morning. Allow us not to get distracted by putting it off indefinitely. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. So glad you joined us this morning. We're grateful for that. Uh, we're going to be celebrating Easter next week. Throughout the week, we're going to be posting a number of different videos, uh, hitting some different passages that are so important leading up to that Easter Sunday. Um, next Friday, actually, Pastor Justin will be releasing a message uh, particularly on the crucifixion. And so I hope you uh, tune into that, you watch that. Um, we'll also be celebrating the Lord's Supper next week together. And I'm giving you a little bit of advance notice uh, because we want the opportunity for us to say, you gather some, some, uh, some crackers, some juice, save that for next Sunday, and then we'll celebrate that together. And I know it's not the same as we normally do, but it's so important that we remember together the death of Jesus, that, that new covenant that we're given. And so I hope you'll uh, make some preparation for next Sunday to be able to do that. You'll be saying, uh, tuning in. And we also want to thank you for all those who are continuing to financially give and support the church online. Um, you can give online or you can also still mail in your checks to 329 South Street. And uh, during this time, 
uh, the mission of Jesus is never more important. And so we're we're so excited to be able to continue to partner together with that. I'm going to ask uh, Phil uh, to lead us in a uh, final song together. God bless. Love you. Thank you, Andrew. You know, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowd had a misunderstanding about the type of Messiah that Jesus was. We have the benefit of knowing that Jesus is a Messiah who saves not by might, but by love and by self-sacrifice. He sacrificed himself on the cross for you, for me, for the whole world. Let's worship this Messiah together.
And now Andrew is going to close us in prayer. Thank you so much, Phil, for leading us together in a time of worship. Uh, I hope this week, even today, that you find opportunities to choose joy. The psalmist tells us that this is the day that God has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. And it's encouragement for all of us to find something today even to be grateful for. Maybe it's a little bit of sunshine. Maybe it's a bird singing. Maybe it's the coming of spring. Maybe it's an act of kindness that you see. Uh, but uh, certainly today, find something to choose joy. Reminder that next week we'll be celebrating communion together, the Lord's Supper together, but separately. So be preparing for that. And then uh, we also, this uh, at the 11 o'clock, right after the service, and then next uh, on next Wednesday as well, we'll be gathering together for Zoom calls. We're going to kind of make those a routine uh, in our schedule. So if you want to jump on, say hi to some uh, familiar faces, meet some new people, um, certainly use this opportunity even to invite other people that you know may be struggling, that may be lonely, uh, they don't have to be a part of the church family, but we want to see God expand his uh, ministry and uh, share his love through this time. So there's others that you know that would benefit from this, from the services, from the Zoom calls, um, after the service, uh, Wednesday, uh, 4 or 5 o'clock-ish, um, definitely uh, plug them in. Also, you don't want to miss it. We've had a couple released already, but this next week and two weeks, we're going to be having um, almost a video a day released talking about the Passion Week. So it's going to be really exciting. I know you're not going to want to miss that. Um, so just opportunities to reflect, to share, and to focus on different aspects of that last week of Jesus' life um, before his crucifixion and then the resurrection. So you won't want to miss those either. Um, absolutely love you. Wish I could give you all a big hug. Uh, but uh, that day is soon coming. God bless.